Level up your listening with Bose Quiet Comfort Ultra Earbuds and Headphones with immersive sound and world class noise cancellation for a not so silent night. Visit Bose.com slash Spotify to shop sound that's more than a present. Shop the Plato's Closet Black Friday event in North Charleston and West Ashley and let the deals begin. You know Plato's Closet always has a huge selection of trendy recycled styles at amazing prices, but Black Friday deals are different. They're better. We've been holding back some of our best inventory, and you won't want to miss our Black Friday event. Save on gently used styles from Patagonia, Lululemon, Lily Pulitzer, and hundreds of popular brands. Plato's Closet is ready to let the Black Friday deals begin. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. This is Space Time Series 24, Episode 86, for broadcast on the 28th of July, 2021. Coming up on Space Time, geologic evidence of climate change on Mars, heavy metals found in comets, and India tests its engines for its new manned spacecraft. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA's Mars Curiosity rover has been studying geologic evidence of massive ancient climate change on the Red Planet. The new study enriches science's understanding of where the Martian rock record preserved or destroyed evidence of Mars' past, and possibly any signs of life that evidence may have contained. Today, of course, Mars is a planet of extremes. It's bitterly cold, it has high radiation levels on the surface, and it's bone dry. But billions of years ago, Mars was a warm, wet world with streams and lakes that could have sustained life. As the planet's climate changed, one of these many lakes in Mars's Gale Crater, where Curiosity now explores, slowly dried out. The six-wheel car-sized rover now has evidence that super-salty water, known as brines, seeped deep through the cracks between grains of soil in the parched lake bottom and altered the clay-mineral-rich layers beneath. The findings, reported in the journal Science, adds to the understanding of where the rock record preserved or destroyed evidence of Mars's past and any possible signs of ancient life those rocks contained. The study's lead author, Mars Curiosity rover mission scientist Tim Bristow from NASA's Ames Research Center in California, says scientists used to think that once these layers of clay minerals formed at the bottom of the lake in Gale Crater, they stayed that way, preserving that moment in time for billions of years. However, the new study shows that brines later broke down these clay minerals in some places, essentially resetting the rock record. Scientists compared samples taken from two areas about half a kilometre apart. Both were in a layer of mudstone deposited billions of years ago at the bottom of the lake at Gale Crater. Surprisingly, in one area, about half the clay minerals they were expecting to find were missing. Instead, they found mudstones rich in iron oxides, the minerals which give the red planet its characteristic rusty red colour. Scientists know the mudstones sampled were about the same age and started out the same as those nearby loaded with clays. So, why then, as Curiosity explored the sedimentary clay deposits along Gale Crater, did patches of clay minerals and the evidence they preserve disappear? Minerals are like time capsules. They provide a record of what the environment was like at the time they formed. Clay minerals have water in their structure, and they're evidence that the soils and rocks they contain came into contact with water at some point. Previous work had already pointed out that while Gale Crater's lakes were present and even after they dried out, groundwater moved below the surface, dissolving and transporting chemicals. After they were deposited and buried, it seems some mudstone pockets experienced different conditions and processes due to interactions with these waters, and that changed their mineralogy. This process is known by geologists as degenesis, and often complicates or erases the soil's previous history, writing down a new one. Geogenesis, however, creates an underground environment that can support microbial life, and these are excellent places to look for evidence of ancient life and gauge habitability. By comparing the details of minerals from both samples, Tim concluded that briny water filtering down through overlying sedimentary layers was responsible for the changes. 
Unlike the relatively freshwater lake present when the mudstones first formed, the salty water is suspected to have come from later lakes, lakes that existed in an overall drier environment. Scientists believe the results offer further evidence of the impact of Mars's climate change billions of years ago. This is Space Time. Still to come, heavy metal found in comets, and India tests engines for its new manned spacecraft. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. Astronomers have discovered iron and nickel in the cold atmospheres of distant comets for the first time. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, are based on observations undertaken by two teams of astronomers using data from the European Southern Observatory's Very Large Telescope in Chile. One of the study's authors, Jean Manfroid from the University of Liège in Belgium, says he was surprised to discover nickel and iron in approximately equal amounts in the atmospheres of some 20 solar system comets observed over the past two decades, even ones which were far away from the Sun. Astronomers know that heavy metals exist inside comets, but what wasn't known is that these metals could sublimate that it's become gaseous even in very low temperatures, and then wind up being seen in the comet's atmospheres when they're far away from the sun. The Belgian team found spectroscopic readings for both nickel and iron vapours in comets more than 480 million kilometres from the sun. That's three times further than the Earth's sun distance. The data suggests that for every 100 kilograms of water vapour in a comet's atmosphere, there's at least a gram of iron and about the same amount of nickel. And that's unusual because there's usually around 10 times more iron than nickel in the atmospheres of comets close to the Sun. Meanwhile, the second study published in Nature, this one by a team of Polish scientists, looked at the interstellar comet 2I Borisov, finding gaseous nickel in that comet's atmosphere as well. The study's lead author Piotr Gutznik from the Jagiellonian University in Poland says the findings were such a surprise, they repeated the observations several times just to make sure their spectral readings were right. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with Professor Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science. Heavy metals in comet vapour. This has uh, just been discovered and I'm guessing there's a, a paper or at least some form of study that's uh, come up with this uh, interesting d- discovery, this interesting find? Indeed, yeah. Um, th- there is there is a paper and um, lots of press about it as well, because it's a really interesting result. And I should tell you that these studies use the telescopes of the European Southern Observatory down there in Chile, which are pretty well the, the best equipped large telescopes in the Southern Hemisphere. There are a few other ones down there that are pretty damn good as well. But the four telescopes yeah. of the very large telescope, they're, they're cracking good. So they were used to make these observations. What's interesting about this is by heavy metals, actually, we should perhaps just define that for a minute, Andrew, because astronomers good idea. Have, got a, have got a very funny view of what constitutes a metal. And a metal in astronomy is anything other than hydrogen and helium. So oxygen's a metal. Calcium's a metal. Oh, right. Yeah. It's always been like that. I guess probably since the start of astronomical spectroscopy, the idea of breaking up the light from stars and um, finding out what signatures of elements you can get in there. But yeah, the the, uh, metals are anything... Uh, heavier than hydrogen or helium. So when you talk about heavy metals, you're really talking about what you and I would call metals in normal life, Mm. and in particular, iron and nickel. And iron is the commonest uh, metal in the universe. In fact, one of the commonest elements, and it's because it's it's a byproduct of the nuclear processes that go on inside stars when they're in their normal adult life. So iron is being created towards the end of the life of the star, actually. Anyway, the bottom line is iron is common, nickel is common. Now, There is an interesting little factoid about this, though, and that is that um, we find, for example, in the core of the Earth, it's an iron-nickel core, and the iron usually
greatly outweighs mm. the nickel when you find it in in nature and like metallic asteroids or or the core of a planet it's usually 10 times more iron than nickel which is understandable because iron's more readily produced inside stars but in this story we find that in these comets you've got more or less equal proportions and that is unexpected that there are equal proportions of iron and nickel in the comets now we've known for a long time that comets must have this sort of stuff in their material remember comets are icy bodies with lots of dust embedded in the ice and that dust includes heavy metals and the temperatures of these things are typically colder than minus 100 degrees Celsius. So they're very, very cold. The metals normally remain very much as grains of dust, basically, not anything that's vapour. But that's the surprise with these observations. And it comes from groups in Poland and Belgium, I think, are the um, main centres where the astronomers who've uh, worked on this come from. There are two studies, actually. In fact, let me get it right. The first study is the, the solar system comets, and that's the Belgian study. The second one is our old friend Comet Borisov, which has been looked at by a group from Poland. Boris. And, <laughs> Boris, that's the one, yeah. Both of them have found this unexpected result that the metals turn up in the vapour of the comet, the stuff that's ejected from the comet when it gets near the sun, so that material vaporises. Now, normally, these elements, uh, they vaporise at very high temperatures, 700 degrees Celsius or thereabouts. And we're talking here about minus 100. So what's going on? I should just clarify there that when I say vaporise, I mean they sublimate. And sublimation is the process when a solid turns directly to a gas which happens a lot in astronomy because it's what elements do in a vacuum, basically. It goes straight from solid to gas. It's why on the surface of Mars, which is not a vacuum but not quite, ice doesn't turn into water. It just turns straight into water vapour. So that's the process, sublimation. But the mystery, yeah, why why is it that at these ultra-low temperatures, these metals are, are turning into vapours? And I think, as I understand the research, I can quote actually from the paper, and you'll see the problem. The paper says... Unbound nickel atoms seem to originate from the photodissociation of a short lived nickel containing molecule that sublimates at not low temperatures or is otherwise released with major volatile compounds. Did you get all that, Andrew? Because that's the answer. Yes, it did. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what it means is that the key word there is photodissociation. It's the radiation of the sun hitting these things, and it's a nickel containing molecule and basically the radiation from the sun sh- shoots out the the nickel atoms and the same is probably true with the iron i think that's the the story that it's all about the sun's radiation acting directly on these atoms if you'd asked me fred if you'd asked me to guess before you told me the answer i would have said i'm i'm going to imagine it's something to do with the sun hitting the comet yeah you see that's you what sh- i would have said you should be an astronomer andrew because you well you've been no mix, mixed <laughs> up with it for thinking. too long <laughs> But yeah, absolutely right. Um, I'll be a journalist. We don't have to think much. I think that's not quite true, but never mind. Sorry. (laughs) I don't think you think at all, do you? (laughs) No, no, I never said that. (laughs) Um, Journalists, I think, have to think an awful lot. And um, a lot of them, these forensic journalists and, you know, investigative journalists, they're doing a fantastic job and covering all kinds of miscreants. Yeah, it's tough work, though. Yeah, it would be. Don't make many friends. No, I bet you don't. I bet you don't. It's a good job you've got me, isn't it, really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, going back to that, you were right on the money. It's to do with the sun's radiation. To be honest, I would have guessed something similar, but I think I would have got it wrong. I think you got it right. I would have thought, oh, it's the subatomic particles in the solar wind that do this. And it doesn't look as though that's what it is. It's, the, it's actually the radiation, mm. uh, the light radiation from the sun. So there you go. Well, when I, when I say I think it's got something to do with the sun... That's a pretty broad answer. (laughs) Yes. That could mean anything. So that's a journalist at work. Yeah, that's right. Make it broad. (laughs) So I guess the the nice twist in this is the Polish work that um, has looked at Comet Borisov, the first interstellar comet that we've ever observed, and found that it's got very, very similar properties to solar system comets. It seems to be like a solar system comet in every way, except it's never been near a star. So it's a pristine sample of the raw material of stars and, and planets. Really interesting that it's an icy remnant of the gas and dust cloud, that solar system, wherever it was 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 formed in and this work you know kind of underlines that i'm not surprised the polish uh, looked at borisov it's a very eastern block it's an eastern block (laughs) that's right 
I wonder if that's why they chose to look at it. Well, it's just the opportunity um, presented itself, I imagine. And yeah. I don't suppose we'll ever – can we ever figure out exactly where it came from? Borisov, no, it's kind of a bit of a mystery, mm. really. You can see what direction it came from, but you don't know how long it's been travelling in that direction. Um, no. And like our old friend Umuamua, which uh, came from the direction of the bright star Vega, but when – you know, when Oumuamua was where Vega is, Vega wasn't there. It was somewhere else because Vega's moving as well. The, the, the yeah. comets are moving and Vega is. Anyway, so we'll probably never know. That's Professor Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. Still to come, India tests engines for its new manned spacecraft and China launching more spy satellites. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Well, despite the devastation of COVID-19 on the subcontinent, India says it's continuing with plans to launch its first manned spacecraft on an unmanned test flight later this year. The mission slated for December will test all systems aboard the Gaganyan capsule and will be followed by a second unmanned test flight either next year or in 2023. Now, if all goes well, the Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO, will then undertake the nation's historic first-ever manned spaceflight. As part of the build-up to that mission, ISRO has successfully conducted its third long-duration test of the Vickers engine that will propel the core L110 stage of the GSLV Mark III launch vehicle. The liquid-fueled engine was hot-fired for 240 seconds at the test facility in Tamil Nadu, meeting all its test parameters. This is Space Time. Still to come, China launches three more spy satellites and Israel planning a science mission to the moon to help the world's school kids. All that and more still to come on Space Time. China has launched another three Yaogang-30 spy satellites. The spacecraft, together with a microcommunication satellite, were launched aboard a Long March 2C rocket from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Center in Sichuan Province. Described by Beijing as remote sensing satellites designed to conduct electromagnetic environmental detection and other experimental operations, the Yaogang-30 are actually Signet Electronic Signals Intelligence Gathering satellites designed to eavesdrop on the radio communications of other countries. The launch is all part of China's ongoing preparations for war, with analysts now expecting the People's Liberation Army to undertake a full-scale invasion of Taiwan within the next six years. Last week, the Chinese Communist Party warned Japan that if Tokyo tries to defend Taiwan from Chinese invasion, Beijing will carry out a preemptive thermonuclear attack on Japan. Since 2016, Beijing has launched more than 135 Earth observation satellites designed to provide near-continuous high-resolution monitoring of areas of interest to China. It's also launched some 84 Yaogang spy satellites. These include highly maneuverable spacecraft equipped with high-resolution synthetic aperture radars designed for all-weather day-night reconnaissance, optical satellites with high-resolution CCD remote sensing cameras giving resolutions down to 0.1 metres, and Signet signals intelligence gathering satellites. The launch marked the 380th flight of a Long March rocket, China's largest launch vehicle family. This is Space Time. Still to come... Israel plans a science mission to the moon to help the world's school kids. And later in the science report, a new study shows that just 7% of the human genome is uniquely shared with other humans. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Wells Fargo presents one of the surest ways to grow your money. A Wells Fargo CD account, where you can earn a 5.00% annual percentage yield on an 11-month term with a minimum opening deposit of $5,000. 
Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash CD rates to open a CD account and start growing your savings with us. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. Hello, saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. Space I.O., a non-profit Israeli initiative whose spacecraft crashed during a lunar landing attempt two years ago, have now secured enough funding to attempt a second moon mission. The company says new donor pledges means it's now raised most of the $100 million it'll cost to try for another moon mission in 2024. The new funding comes from South African Israeli billionaire Maurice Khan, who bankrolled much of the first mission, as well as French Israeli billionaire Patrick Drahi and South African philanthropist Martin Marshall from Entry Capital. The first Genesis spacecraft, built by Space IO with help from Israeli aerospace industries, crashed as it was on final landing approach moments before its expected touchdown in April 2019. The new Genesis 2 mission, as it will be called, will be even more ambitious, with plans for a lunar orbiter to deploy two lunar landers. Each of the 60-kilogram landers will aim for a different spot on the lunar far side. Meanwhile, the orbiter will remain in lunar orbit, serving as a platform for educational science activities, specifically designed to allow school kids from around the world to participate in deep space research. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study in the British Medical Journal has found a possible link between the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine and facial paralysis. The case involves a patient who experienced two episodes of facial paralysis, known as Bell's palsy, one after the first and another following the second dose of Pfizer vaccine. Scientists say it suggests that Bell's palsy may be linked to the treatment. The report says the 61-year-old man experienced weak or paralyzed muscles on the right side of his face five hours after receiving his first dose of Pfizer-BioNTech, and a more severe episode on the left side of his face two days after receiving his second dose. The authors report his symptoms have now greatly improved and the patient is almost back to normal. The potential new side effect follows previous reports of inflammation of muscles surrounding the heart showing up as another potential side effect those taking the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. The World Health Organization now estimates over 8 million people have been killed by the COVID-19 coronavirus, with over 4.15 million confirmed fatalities and some 193 million people infected since the deadly disease first spread out of Wuhan, China. A new study has found that alcohol consumption was linked to more than 740,000 new cases of cancer in 2020. Researchers found that 4% of newly diagnosed cancer cases last year may have been associated with drinking alcohol. The findings reported in the Lancet Medical Journal looked at levels of alcohol intake per person per country in 2010. 10 years prior to the cancer case data in order to allow for the time it takes for the alcohol intake to affect cancer development. They then combined that data with statistics for new cancer cases in 2020. Risky and heavy drinking was estimated to contribute to the highest number of cancer cases. But even moderate drinking, the equivalent of just two daily drinks, was estimated to lead to more than 103,000 cases in 2020. That's almost one in seven of all alcohol-associated cases. The study found that men accounted for 77% of all alcohol-associated cancer cases. The largest proportion of cancer cases linked to alcohol were found in Eastern Asia, closely followed by Central and Eastern Europe. But among women, the largest proportion of cancer cases that were attributed to alcohol were in Australia and New Zealand, as well as Central and Eastern Europe. A new study has found that just 7% of your genome is uniquely shared with other humans and not shared by other early hominid ancestors. The findings reported in the journal Science Advances are based on DNA comparisons between 179 modern-day Homo sapiens and now extinct Neanderthals and Denovicians dating back to between 40 and 50,000 years. 
The authors found that an even smaller genome fraction, just 1.5%, is both unique to Homo sapiens and shared among all people living today. Researchers already knew that modern-day humans shared some DNA with Neanderthals, but different people seem to share different parts of their genome. The new research focused on finding out which genes are exclusive to Homo sapiens. There are growing concerns that rainbow lorikeets in northern New South Wales and southern Queensland are becoming paralysed, often fatally, because of some mysterious illness. Scientists with the University of Sydney and the RSPCA are studying this lorikeet paralysis syndrome, which appears to affect thousands of birds between October and June. Researchers are now asking the public to help them identify the likely source of the disease, which is thought to most likely be a plant toxin. The syndrome causes limb, neck and tongue paralysis and an inability to blink or swallow, rendering the birds unable to fly and feed and therefore to survive. The study, published in the Australian Veterinary Journal, found lorikeets only have a 60% chance of recovery and their treatment requires intensive care followed by extensive rehabilitation. Based on the pathology, researchers have ruled out an infectious disease like a virus and are instead looking at a toxin released by a plant that only blooms or is fruit during the warmer months of the year. Well, if you like your television, you'll probably be really interested in Samsung's enormous 110-inch micro-LED 4K TV. But it doesn't come cheap. With the details, we're joined by technology editor Alex Sahara of Reut from ITY.com. Yeah, well, it's 110 inches, so it's huge. It's priced at over 150,000 US dollars, which is I'll over 200,000. That's right. And it's over $200,000 in Australia. Now, this is a 4K TV. You can That's actually get a bit of a down. Why wouldn't it be 8K? The thing is that micro LED technology is pretty new. And for them to be able to release a 110-inch model is quite amazing. And look, there's ever more 4K content and the, the chips inside the TVs are very good at upscaling. They can upscale 1080p to 4K. They can upscale 4K to 8K. I mean, it took a while for there to be a lot of uh, 4K content and now there's plenty of it. What is micro LED? So, well, this is a tiny little light-emitting diode, which is separate to and different from OLED. OLED uses organic light-emitting diodes, which is why it's called OLED, and they have a limited lifespan and they're also prone to what's known as permanent burn-in. And they also supposedly are restricted in peak brightness. Now, micro LED, the, the little LED light can emit its own light as well, but it's not organic, not in the same way that OLED is. You know, micro LEDs is a technology that is and delivering the same kind of ability for the individual pixels to be their own light source. They don't, I mean, normally LCDs will have a backlight that shines through. And when a backlight is shining through pixels, it's very hard to get deep blacks. And so micro LEDs are meant to be brighter than OLED displays. And in fact, Apple has been working on micro LEDs for the Apple Watch and iPads. These micro-sized LEDs are supposed to last for over 100,000 hours. So that's, in theory, more than a decade of typical TV watching. The micro LED is meant to be the successor to the LCD screens that we've had, the QLED screens that, that Samsung has taught, spoken about, and it's meant to be their version of a better form of OLED technology. And we're going to hear a lot more about it. To see a 110-inch model at 150,000, I mean, it's, most of these things start off quite expensive, but you know, within five years, it'll just be the standard technology sold in the Best Buys in the US and JB Hi-Fi's in Australia. And uh, you know, everyone, will, people will have forgotten about the old LCD technologies and they'll all be talking about micro LEDs. How much is it the LED and how much is it the process processor that the TV has? Well, it's a combination of the two. I mean, obviously, the processors these days are, are very advanced. I mean, you're talking about smart, you know, the latest flagship smartphone type of processors. And uh, Samsung has their own micro AI processor, which is designed to maintain consistent 4K HDR, and talking about bright, vivid, and realistic picture quality. I mean, you often see these cheap TVs, or at least you saw them in years gone by, where they said, oh, we have a Samsung panel, or we have an LG panel. And it comes out of the same factory that Samsung or LG has. But the difference is in the processor. The processor yeah. is what takes all of the video and especially with things like sport when you've got balls flying across a field you know on older TVs you would see a ghosting effect or you would see jerkiness but on the most modern TVs with the latest processors all of that is smooth as silk and uh, the TV can uh, even convert older stuff and allow it to be upscaled to higher quality or to have HDR type of effect where the picture is of much richer quality and sometimes you need to have two TVs side by side to really appreciate it. I remember seeing a laser TV back in the mid 2000s and they had a plasma TV next to it and they had the laser TV
TV next to it. And the laser TV had much richer colors. At, and they explained that you know your brain only really sees these when they're side by side. Once you turn the laser TV off and you start watching, in this case, the plasma TV again, after a few minutes, your brain stopped noticing that it wasn't as bright and as clear as the laser TV was. So for, you know that's why a lot of people buy a $600 or TV, 40, 50, 60, 65 inches for $600 in, a, in Australia. It would be definitely cheaper in the US. And you, you have an amazing TV, which is genu- genuinely better than the TVs from three, four, five years ago that a lot of people are still using. My brother purchased a 55-inch TV for 150 bucks, which probably is about you know less than $100 in US money uh, from 2013. And it looks fantastic. But you buy the latest TVs today, they can connect to Xboxes and Playstations and the latest Blu-ray players to have this most vivid and incredible colors with the smoothest of graphics, as well as very advanced built-in smart TV technology that can uh, have all the Netflixes and YouTubes and other TV apps that we're used to. And a lot of people, though, don't want to spend $5,000 on a new TV. So they'll buy a Google Chromecast with Google TV or an Apple TV or a Roku or one of those sort of devices that can upgrade the smarts of their TV. So, you know, just because Samsung launches a $150,000 US TV at 110 inches, that's like a statement piece. That's the technology that will trickle down and become available in every TV that's sold, you know, within the next decade and probably sooner. That's Alex Sahara of Royd from ITY.com. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. Wells Fargo presents one of the surest ways to grow your money. A Wells Fargo CD account where you can earn a 5.00% annual percentage yield on an 11-month term with a minimum opening deposit of $5,000. Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash CD rates to open a CD account and start growing your savings with us. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. 